Welcome, Isabel. Isabel is the CEO of Angie, and we have the pleasure of being here again at the Women's Forum. I am thrilled to be back with friends, old and new, sisters, people that we have had engaging conversations with, that we have sought to find solutions to some of the world's toughest challenges, and that we have addressed those challenges from a woman's perspective. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to doing that today, and I'm pleased to be able to be here with Isabel to kick off the sessions and to start to look for ways that we can find solutions and take action and engage. So welcome, Isabel. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a big pleasure for me to, to be back here. And you know, uh, last week, uh, women in Africa were meeting exactly as we're doing today, and I could feel the same kind of potential of uh, energy, motivation, willingness to, to change things. And well, I told them they are very courageous, these women in Africa. And I told them that I would say a word for them here and to, to greet them from, from here. And I believe we can really applaud them. I'm very interested to hear more about what you talked about when you were in Marrakesh. But I'm also interested to hear um, how you feel about my country, the US's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement. And I have to say that as an American, I am absolutely horrified. Um, and the last time I was here at the Women's Forum, we knew that we were um, going through very challenging times. I'm not sure that we knew the disruption that was about to approach us and that we are struggling through right now. But as we both know, climate doesn't stop at anybody's border. And with the US pulling out, I wonder how that's affecting your strategy and how we move forward. Well, to try to, not an easy question, but, but to try to, to answer your question, I like to tell you two conversations I, I had over the last uh, 15 days. So the, the, the first one is precisely in New York with uh, Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg, uh, maybe you know him, is a famous um, founder and CEO of one of the biggest uh, financial companies specialized in financial data. Very tough, very talented uh, businessman. And during the, the climate week in New York, uh, he organized a summit a business summit, huge one, 250 CEOs, 40 uh, head of state, so really big event. And the theme of this event was, well, we have to change the world. The, so the conversation I had with him was to prepare that. And, you know, to see in this temple of business, uh, this so direct discussion with this, all these um, business representatives saying climate change is a last call. We have to invent something new. Impressive, really imp it, it, it impressed me. So your country is not, uh, well, away from this, this big move. I don't believe that at all. The second conversation is well, a few days after, just a few days after, it was in Africa. It was with uh, a very young woman, very impressive one, extremely young, 25, maybe 28, not more. And she founded from scratch um, a company specialized in the training of young Africans to, well, to make them able to install large scale and rapidly all the new energy technologies that are coming to the market. And, you know, these so different people, difficult to make more different between these two guys, frankly. In fact, they see the same. They have the same intuition. They have, they have the same hope. And I have to say, I share it deeply, which is that something new is coming. Because climate change um, changes a lot of things, and not only climate. I believe really that the level of awareness of people, I'm sure that the case for yourself, but not only look around you, 
young generation in particular, the level of awareness is bigger than ever. And it provoked already very concrete, concrete con consequences, let's say. A lot of money came to the market to finance new technologies. And new these technologies, they are ready. And not only they will allow us to battle against, against climate change, because they are decarbonized, they are also much more flexible than before. They are very, in, in energy we see the, we say the 3Ds, the new technologies, they are 3Ds. They are decarbonized, yes, so battle against climate change is now possible. But also they are decentralized and digitalized and much more rapid to implement. And then not only they will be well, they will allow to battle against climate change, but they will also allow to do what is undoable for decades, which is to bring energy everywhere. And you all know that, well, without energy there is nothing. There is no development, there is no health, there is no education. So development is not possible. Life, good life, is not possible. So, well, which is, I believe, full of hope is that, in fact, this climate change provoked something which will be far beyond that. And with also a new, a new kind of worldwide governance with the Paris Agreement, and I hope one day the U.S. will be back to that. And I believe, frankly, one day, I don't know when, but even before that, I can tell you that the business community is fully behind. So we, are not, we have not to be naive. It won't be easy because um, to invent this, uh, this new world, we have to, well, to think long run. We have to invest for the long term. And at the same time, we have to, well, to compete with the existing rules. And they are e extremely short term driven. And I spoke about New York and I can tell you Despite this huge summit, when I, uh, I, I come back in, the, in a few uh, weeks for the roadshows for NG, I'm sure I will be challenged for the, on the cash of the quarter. So everything in, is not aligned. That's not easy. But I'm sure that things are moving. And that's the purpose of our company, to be a pioneer of this, uh, of this move. That's a very, very hopeful response. And I'm glad to hear that. I, I too was in New York for the United Nations and saw that there were many, many business leaders and many American business leaders who were working side by side to address the issues. Which brings me to the question of leadership. How and what is our responsibility as leaders to help foster the, the development and the talent and the solutions and the innovation? I believe that it's not it is a question we probably we all face and, and, and every day. Um, I would say vision first. I would say that the first role of a leader for me is effectively to forge a vision not alone, but to absorb the reality, uh, listen a lot, and at the, at the end being able to detect what are the long trends, what is the vision for the future, and then what is the vision for the company and the purpose of the company. And to keep that every day in mind, a very determined way. And to make it real, not only a vision that would be a concept, but to make it real and to fit with when you have uh, decisions to make, strategic decisions to make in particular. And to be extremely obsessively cons consistent wi with it. That I would say that's the first, the first rule, I believe, for, for a leader. And the second one is to make the bridge every day between this long-term vision, which is li like a light at the horizon, and the day-to-day -day life. And the day-to-day -day life, we, we all live in a very, very volatile, more than ever, volatile, uncertain environment. And to make the bridge between the two and to create the conditions to make that people, they can really keep that purpose in mind every day, and they can find their ways in the volatile environment that they face every day to, well, to meet this objective. 
And I believe that the leader is no longer a manager. Manager is somebody who has to say, well, who has to tell to people what they have to do day to day. A leader for me is more somebody who is able to say where we go there, long when we go there. And well, that's your role now, to go there. How can I help you? And you know, a few, a few, um, a few days ago, uh, I heard uh, um, the CEO and, and uh, founder of um, Alibaba, Jack Ma, very inspiring guy in my view. And Jack Ma said, um, smart is beautiful, in fact, more than that, smart is powerful. And I really share that. I believe in decentralized systems. And then for me, to create the condition, it means that, first of all, to make that in our systems, being states, industries, um, whatever, to make that people, they have much more room for maneuver, to make decisions, to take initiatives, um, to invent, to try, to fail, and to learn much more rapidly than, than before. And then very often people, they, so wait, they are not used because that's not the traditional way of management. But in my view, that's what is in front of us. That's what the young generations, they want. And if we want to reconcile the young generations with the big organizations, we have urgently to do so. So uh, here, what, here's what I, I would say. Thank, thank you very much, Isabel. I am going to ask Jean Lumiere to join me on the stage. And Isabel is going to come back. And we're going to have a group conversation in a bit. But thank you so much, Isabel. Welcome. Jean Lemier, the chair of the board of BMP Paribas. Welcome. Welcome to the Women's Forum. Bonjour. Je suis désolé. Je ne parle pas très bien. Je quand même vous saluer en français ici. Malheureusement, je ne parle pas très bien. Si, si, vous parlez très bien. On va continuer à parler en français. Let us shift to English. Okay. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> so yesterday you hosted your own forum on sustainability. Um, I'd like to hear what the outcome was. I saw your speech. It was inspiring. You talked about your vision. You talked about the need for inclusiveness in sustainability. You talked about the need for private-public partnerships to come together and to set achievable goals. Can you give us some of the, the feedback and the input and the insights that you gained from your conference on sustainability? Well, thank you for talking about this. And uh, it's a reward for my colleagues here because they have spent a lot of time organizing the, uh, the conference. Uh, but I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to speak about visions. Uh, I think all of us, we, sh we share the same vision. The world should be sustainable. We, we agree. I hope, huh? I hope we agree here. If not, please tell me. But I, I think we share the same view. The question is no longer the vision. The question is the implementation. And uh, I know how important is implementation for women and for the forum. Uh, the question is not to speak. The question is to deliver. The question is not PR. The question is to mean business. So what have we tried to do? Maybe my speech, but chairman are for speeches. You know. uh, more important, we have tried to put together uh, uh, small companies, asset managers, uh, investors, uh, trying to understand what could be done in an efficient way, how it should be done. Uh, the uh, 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 Minister uh, uh, for Environment working with uh, State Minister uh, Hulot came and give us, uh, she has given very clear guidance about where the, the public sector is today. And that was great. Uh, the mood was excellent. You could see 
the beginning of a crystallization of concrete projects. And that's what we like. We are very humble. Uh, the job of a bank is uh, to provide uh, financing, and you know that we have developed a lot of green financing, uh, to provide uh, services such as advisory, uh, but even more uh, to put people together, to create bridges, uh, to make sure that people understand each other and uh, the needs uh, are met by resources, by financial resources. And uh, we have organized such a meeting. The first one was not in Paris. The first one was in Singapore. And uh, yesterday was the first one in Paris. The next ones will be in Brazil, once more in Singapore, in New York. And uh, you know, I think this is a contribution we have to improving uh, uh, the debate and delivering concrete goals, which is simply to put people together to speak and, and maybe to work a little financing companies. And how it was a good meeting. Please join us. I'm sure my colleagues will do the best for you to join in various cities. You've talked a lot about the need for inclusiveness. How do you ensure inclusiveness and resource it from a financial standpoint, particularly when you're talking about sustainability? Uh, I'll try to answer your question maybe coming from uh, far. I'm sorry if it is too distant. But the theme you speak about is uh, disruption. And when I look what's happening today about disruption, I see a lot of disruption. But I see also hopes. And when I look at what has happened in my part of the world, which is continental Europe, there are hopes. People have just voted in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, and Italy soon. And what is the message? We share the European values of cooperation and openness, meaning Europe, meaning the Euro, meaning putting resources together to fight terrorism and promote security and defense. So I understand the word disruption, but we need also to understand what citizens, what we want. I think here what we want is cooperation and openness. And this is not easy, I agree. Many people tend to take a different view, but that's wrong. And it goes to, to your question, because even if there's hope and positive views, many people are not, let's be uh, modest and, and polite, but are not comfortable about the current uh, stage of affairs. Uh, they vote in a different way. They, ten they tend to take different views, and they do not support openness. And we need to be careful about this, and very careful. This is a challenge for us, citizens, and this is a challenge for the business. We need to pay attention. And we need to do our best to make sure that inclusion is promoted. And there are many questions behind this. You have technology. This is a serious debate. The speed of te technological changes may frighten people, and I can understand. And we have, especially in the corporate sector, to find answers to this. Uh, the fear of not having a job is a serious question. And we need to understand this. And we can do a lot for this. Uh, and even more, uh, the fact that there are, people are frightened by what's coming from elsewhere. And let's be honest, there is a serious debate about what is being called in Germany refugees, what we call in many countries, other countries in Europe, migrants. And I think there is a common point behind this, is that each of us, we need to be careful about providing services, environment, context, in which people feel more comfortable. I will give you a very modest example in, in my industry, in BNP Paribas. We are a bank. We offer services to individuals, to each of you. 
But in the society, you have many people who cannot get access to a banking account for various reasons. We may have a long discussion about this, but this is a fact, and this is a fact in France and in many countries. They are not allowed, they cannot have a banking account. It's impossible to live in our societies without an account. You need to make transfers, you need to receive, even to get an employment subsidies, you need an account. If you don't have, you are out, out of the game, which is terrible. This is the reason we have uh, invested in a, a company uh, many of you uh, know, which is the Compte Nickel. What is the Compte Nickel? It's not a bank. It's a payment system. And it has been created by two great guys. And they have developed a system through which people who do not want, who cannot have access to a banking account, can have a payment account. And they can live a more normal life. It's not huge, I agree. It will not change the whole society. But this is a good example of what each of us we should do. Right. Action and figuring out solutions. So thank you very much, Jean. We will revisit that. We'll talk about collaboration and cooperation um, as soon as we first have a conversation with Arthur and Cousin. Thank you very much. Welcome, Ertherin. Thank you, my friend. Ertherin is my, my sister friend. We have been <laughs> friends for a very, very long time. Um, and I have to take this moment to welcome also, we have a large group of sister friends who are here from the US participating in the Women's Forum again this year, um, and some who are new. So I, we welcome all of our sister friends who are here. Ertherin. <laughs> Thank you. Ertherin, uh, formerly head of the World Food Program, and now an adjunct professor at Stanford University, an expert in food safety, food security, access to food, and most importantly, taking care of those without food. Well, Anne, I very much appreciate that introduction. Thank you. Um, I uh, have been called the woman who believes that we can end hunger. And so all of those issues that go along with that access, food safety as you noted, but more importantly, nutrition and availability of food, of, of nutritious food for all people all the time. So coming off of the United Nations, the United Nations Sustainable Goals, last week it was revealed and discussed that there are 20 million people who suffer from famine in this world. During your time at, as the head of the World Food Program, you had initiated a zero hunger program. I know you work very hard and tirelessly. What's needed to address that challenge and the need and what's needed both from civil society, from private public partnerships, how do we get at a solution so that those 20 million people have hope? Well, the good news is there are not 20 million people suffering from famine. There are 20 million people on the verge of suffering from famine. And that is good news because they've been in this position for several, for almost a year now, and it's directly related to conflict. When humanitarians have access during periods of crisis, we don't totter or teeter into famine. When there is, we can make food available to those who can't otherwise provide for the food needs of their own families. The four countries that Anne noted were, was discussing in her question are Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Northeast Nigeria. What all of those countries and those areas have in common is conflict. And overcoming the challenges of conflict, ensuring that we, are, we do address the ability or we, we create the ability for peace and stability and security is a foundational requirement for, for meeting the SDGs in any country 
and particularly for ensuring that people have the ability to feed themselves. The SDGs give us a benchmark, the vision that you heard the other speakers talk about, the articulated vision as well as the action plan for the way forward, not just to create sustainability, but to ensure that we can provide peace and prosperity. That's the goal. Sustainability is a method for us to get there. Peace and prosperity for all is the goal. The challenge that we have and why we are seeing such a disruption in the world today is because of the non-inclusive nature of growth that we are seeing in so many of our worlds. But we have an opportunity to learn a lesson from the developing world, and that is providing equitable access to opportunity for all is the very basis for beginning to address disruption. Your optimism is endless. <laughs> I, and, and, and it's hopeful. It is very hopeful because being on the front lines and seeing what you have seen, doing what you do day in and day out, to have that vision for what the solution is and how we work together to meet the solution is, is inspiring. Tell us, what is it that we can do together? How can we have discussions over the next two days that will end up in actionable solutions or at least ways to discuss how we get to measurable goals? And I very much appreciate that question and the, particularly the phrasing of that question because it is what can we do together? It is about collective action. It is, it is, it is critical to overcoming what, se what are seemingly intractable problems in the world that we work in a collective manner. And collective manner does not mean that we must all work together, but it must mean that we share a vision, that we agree upon the metrics for determining success and that we communicate with each other about the work that we're performing and about what we are achieving. It is about the results. So long in the developed, developing world, in the, those of us who do development work, it was all about the work. Now there's a recognition that it's all about the results. And having the ability to agree upon what are those results that we're going to achieve, and then the, the, creating the mechanisms for communicating, the measurements that will support the achievement of the goals that we all share. On that note, I think it's a perfect opportunity for us to bring up our other two leaders so that we can have that discussion Terrific. collectively and collaboratively. Thank you. You're going to stay here with me, and I'm going to invite Isabel and Jean to join us in the conversation. I think that was, that was exactly where we need to start this conversation together with Isabel heading up Angie and being on the front lines of energy and sustainability with Jean and financial services and banking and resourcing and his commitment to sustainability and with civil society and NGOs and how we actually implement this and whether that needs to be, and this is the question, do we need to work collaboratively, collectively, and what's the most important outcome? Isabel, I'll let you start. So collaboration is, of course, key uh, to meet all these um, huge uh, targets. Uh, to, collaboration, by the way, is also a question internally in our big organizations. I suppose being NGOs, being uh, big banks, banks, or, or being industries. That's uh, something we all, all face. In my view, the more you fix a very ambitious vision, very ambitious target, the more you get collaboration. Because you are people that are just forced in one sense and then, well, just to give you an example, at NG, I told you, we, we have decided to pioneer this, uh, this move. So, uh, and to be consistent, we sorted our activities. And at the end of the screening, we went to the conclusion that 80% of our activities, they are effectively at the core of the future, belonging to this uh, 3D world I mentioned, and 20% no. 
And then we decided to dispose. And we said, okay, since it's clearly what has to be done for the future, but we still have to stick with existing short-term driven rules, we, may, we will make that, despite we dispose 20% of our activities, we will maintain stable our results. Everybody told us, well, that's just not possible. We, we, we said, yes, it is. And through massive increase of collaboration internally, we, well, we are there. We will fit with that, which was, again, seen as something which was clearly not doable. So I believe a lot in cooperation internally with uh, our stakeholders and, and collaboration with NGOs, um, in my view, is key. These decentralized systems, uh, well, we will need to partner to go much faster in villages. So we have plans to bring microgrids, very decentralized generation um, systems in thousands of villages, but we cannot do, do that alone. We need the bridge with the communities. Uh, we also need financial partners, and they have to, and I use that for, for Jean, they, they, <laughs> they they there's, have to. There's no free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. So they are very used, my dear Jean, uh, to to finance. No, so that's a really a, a topic, and we work on that together. Um, they are used. The financial players. They are used, very used to finance big plans. You know, big systems, big infrastructures. That the kind of tickets they are used to. But when we go to micro systems very small ones, millions of very small ones, they, have, they are not equipped. And then we have to create the conditions again for that too, to make that effectively the money can go there where it is needed with new tools. Uh, so we founded a, a non-for-profit organization, Terawatt, I just seized the opportunity to say one word about that. Very well, important to say so more than Howard one word initiative, about it. it is a non-for-profit organization that gathers a lot of uh, private players working together to make the bridge between the big pockets. Uh, they they really able to invest large large scale in the world, which is uh, well money is available. A lot of money is available. Look at the interest rates; they are sometimes negative. So it means that there is not enough good project to be invested. But there are also huge needs in kind of project, profile of project, which is fully new for them. And we have to create the bridge between the two. So that's the purpose of the IWAT initiative. Yeah, thank you, and congratulations on that. I know that you are chairing that, and you have achieved several, several milestones, and you've done great, great work. Thank you. Erthren, can you talk to the collaboration and the cooperation? Well, it's been stated by the other speakers as well as in my last comment, but I'll, I'll add on and say that when we talk about collective action, we are, yes, talking about government and public and, pri and private sector actors, but we're also including civil society, NGOs, the, the, and community leaders, but also academics. We can't forget about the knowledge that is required to bring to the collective work that we must perform. I would also say we need to include faith leaders. In many of the communities where we work, cultural issues must be overcome in order for us to ensure that the, the learnings that we bring, the opportunities that we develop are institutionalized across the community. And faith leaders can help us do that. And it, it is often one of the best ways to communicate at local level, particularly when you want to include women. Because many times it is the, the you must overcome cultural challenges in a community that faith leaders can help you overcome to bring women to the table and to participate in the activities. And so what, what, how we define collective action should be from a, from a community perspective and not just 
from a global template of who should be involved. And ensuring that we allow what is required at that community level and those who are required at that community level to participate in the work that is necessary to achieve the desired outcomes. And too often, however, we, we don't include the issues of financial inclusion as a part of creating collective action. Because if there is not the money to support the implementation of the ideas and to sustain the work that is necessary for the, the, for the period of time that is required to achieve those results, we will fail. And so I was very excited to hear about the, the raising issues of financial inclusion and bringing in um, nonprofits as a part of the, uh, private, the private sector action because it is all of those different pieces that are necessary to, for success. And that which gets financed gets measured. <laughs> and it brings us back to our goals. But I think it's very important to talk about the universality of communities and that all communities have to come to the table. And we've got to look at outreach to those communities to look at outreach to measure success and to reach the goals. I'd like each one of you to challenge our audience to action something that you think is going to advance where we start this conversation today and where we end the conversation tomorrow evening. Well, well designed, huh? <laughs> uh, may, I'll come back to what you have said because I, I think this is the best answer to your question. Uh, collaboration, of, of course, is good. I share this. But m maybe the forum could spend some time on why it is so demanding and why it is not obvious for many people. We need to be honest. I do share the view, all of us we do, in the room we do, but many people outside will say, hey, what does it mean? I'm challenged by cooperation. I'm threatened by cooperation. Uh, you need not to go very far if you cross the Atlantic or even the Channel. You hear this. So this is serious. And we need to dig into this. We see the beginning of answers. One of them is, without any doubt, uh, uh, public or official sector and private sector partnership. Uh, uh, we need guidance. We need long-term view. I'll take one example. Most of us, we think that the electric, electrical cars are for tomorrow, but it has a huge impact on the industry. What does it mean? You know, what, what, what's going to be the changes in regulation? When? How long? You know, we need long-term guidance, and then we need to do the job. And probably we need to bring on board more guidance. How to do this? with the uh, civil society, with the politicians. That's a very, very difficult challenge. My second remark is collaborating is about understanding. Not being frightened by experts. I was very surprised that most of the British debate a year ago was about the fact that experts didn't have the right to make their point of view. To be an expert is bad. No, it's about Training, it's about education, and this is key. If we don't go back to facts and respect facts and have good discussions, then we shall miss the target. We shall be extremely emotional, and most of the time, pure emotion is against collaboration because it is about, quickly, antagonization. If you look at the time it takes to reconcile countries, communities, it's huge. So let's be very careful. And I do insist on the fact that education and what should be done on education, what for education of everybody, is absolutely key. We shall never be able to collaborate more if we do not change the approach of education in many countries, probably everywhere in the world. This is true for technology, but this is even more important for respect of people, respect of women, respect of communities. This is based on education. And I must say, 
this is urgent to think a little more about this and to be extremely clear about what is education in society. Thank you. Well, I didn't speak about money, but... Uh, <laughs> we know you have the money. I don't want to escape. <laughs> we, we agree. We, we understand well, and I shall take one example to, to show my good faith, huh? because normally bankers always agree, but then you think that when you come, it doesn't. There's one, one point, and I would like to say this to uh, Isabel, because I, th I think Isabel is absolutely right. Technology changes so quickly that there are new companies, and normally we base the credit decision on history. We need to have a track record. And of course, these new companies, they have no track record. So we need to be aware of this and to address this quickly. I'll very quickly say, we have 7.5 billion people on Earth. By 2050, we'll have 9.5 billion people on Earth. 1.3 billion of those people will be in Sub-Saharan Africa. 85% of them will be in uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The challenges that we've seen with migration in Europe, the challenges that we're addressing in the United States with immigration, are directly related to lack of opportunity for people. If we don't provide the kind of collective action that allows us to achieve the sustainable development goals, we've only seen the tip of the problem, the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. Well, that's a great invitation. I just like to rebound on that. So I believe, well, we have to, we have to look at these big challenges and we all have to be convinced that we, everybody here can make a difference. We all can do something which effectively contributes to change this world. We all are much bigger than we believe, in fact. So the first barrier, I believe, in is in ourselves. So my, my last message would be this one. You are all invited. We all are invited to participate to this uh, renewal world, because I believe that's really what, it, what, what matters. Thank you very much. I want to thank my my guest, uh, the leaders who have challenged you all, and I think what the, one of the key takeaways is to go through the forum the next few days, be fearless, address the tough challenges, and collaborate and cooperate. Thank you.